So we uh, continue to work through the Sermon on the Mount, this kind of manifesto for life in the kingdom of God. And you've got the verses there on the screen. Why don't we stand together if you're comfortably able to do that as we mark the importance of these words from Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Do take a seat when you're ready. One uh, summary, uh, one title for these few verses that I saw was Your Treasure is Doomed, um, by which I think they mean your earthly treasure as opposed to your heavenly treasure. Uh, but yeah, your treasure is doomed. Let's look through these verses together. Verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves, or stop storing up for yourselves, treasures on earth. Now, treasures are things that we, we keep because we place value on them. Uh, so even children who have little concept of wealth, and even the abject poor who have no wealth, still know what it means to treasure something, to place value on something. Now imagine a rough sleeper who only has a coat and a sleeping bag. Those two items will be treasured. So we know what it is to treasure things, whether we have much or whether we have very little. Uh, and treasures on earth, according to Jesus, are finite and perishable things like money, things like possessions, but even to things like relationships and careers. And Jesus says that these kinds of things that we, we treasure, that we place value in, uh, rust and vermin or moth and vermin will destroy those treasures. They will literally make them disappear. Um, so this is about more than kind of just damaging or them losing value over time. Jesus is saying, your treasure on earth will one day be no more. It will disappear. Your treasure is doomed one way or another, sooner or later. And, and this is not just, these are not possibilities Jesus is talking about so much as inevitabilities. You can't take it with you, as the saying goes. Instead, Jesus then offers an alternative. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, before we go any further, I just want to stress that this is not Jesus talking about um, some kind of reward in the afterlife. We tend to hear that word heaven and assume that it's talking about some later time. Uh, N.T. Wright, one of the, the good, uh, great New Testament scholars, writes these words, As with other references to heaven and earth, we shouldn't imagine that he means don't worry about this life and instead get ready for the next one. No, heaven here is where is where God is right now. And where if you learn to love and serve God right now, you will have treasure in the present, not just in the future. So this is not Jesus saying that, that his followers have to go without earthly treasures now so that one day, eventually when we die, when we get to heaven, that, that we'll have something better. No, heavenly treasures are also for now and benefit us in the present too. And in Matthew's Gospel, so often what happens is heaven is, is a substitute word for God. So where Matthew talks about the, the kingdom, he often uses the phrase the kingdom of heaven as a shorthand or a, a different way of saying the kingdom of God. And so it's, it's very likely here that what he has in mind is something similar, treasures in God rather than treasures in earthly things. So we're placing our value in God rather than in the things of this earth. And then he finishes with this line, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There are some uh, different ways that we might translate that that are kind of more readily accessible uh, for us. So we could translate that as, uh, as this, for the way you spend your money reveals what is truly important to you. Or if you want to know the true character of a person, look at their bank statement. 
And what Jesus seems to be doing here in these short verses is pitting these two stances against one another. The value, the valuing of money and stuff and possessions on the one hand against valuing God on the other. And the implication is that these two things can't easily coexist. The more we value one, the less we will value the other. So let's pause at this point because it's so easy to rule ourselves out of hearing the teaching of Jesus. Uh, we, we're so good at finding excuses as to why this doesn't apply to me on this particular day at this particular time. So let's just pause and do a little mental exercise. And this is in no way meant to uh, induce guilt. This is just meant to kind of place us in the reality of our own situation so that we can hear this teaching this morning. So there are about just shy of eight, eight billion people in the world right now. And around one billion of those uh, live on less than one dollar a day, 75 pence a day, five pound a week. One billion people in the world. Around 3 billion, so getting up towards half of the world's population, live on less than $2 a day, about £10 a week. And then even if we just kind of zoom in on the UK for a moment, around 20% of the UK currently are living below the poverty line, uh, according to our understanding of that. And my suspicion is that by the end of this year that will be significantly more. Now, with those facts in mind, consider for a moment your stuff. Consider for a moment that the vast majority of us in this room, I would hazard a guess all of us in this room, have spent a lot more than five pounds this week. Many of us will have arrived here in a car, either our own or somebody else's if we had a lift. Most of our homes, I hope, have heating. Most of you will have a, a smartphone or a tablet or a computer, probably. Maybe access to the internet and digital entertainment. We, uh, if we want to, if we're a coffee drinker, we can choose from a startling range of coffees from any number of places. We most likely had breakfast this morning, and if we didn't, it was probably through choice. And we probably have multiple outfits that we could have chosen to wear today. And therefore, we needed a wardrobe to store our clothes in. Now, of course, none of this is to say that we haven't known financial hardship or faced significant challenges in our lives in, in terms of kind of wealth. But what I'm trying to say is even when we say or think of ourselves as poor or not having very much, or at least not being wealthy, we say that in the context of being among the wealthiest people ever to have lived and on planet Earth right now. We say that as being part of this group who are outrageously wealthy compared to most human beings around the globe. And it's a really important point to get across because, sure, we don't live uh, in, the, uh, in the most affluent part of the city even necessarily, but, and it would be easy, therefore, for us to look at the riches of others. And especially to look at the, the super rich, the, the footballers and the celebrities and the, the billionaire tech gurus and, and on all of those people. And then to rule ourselves out of this teaching on wealth because, well, by comparison, we don't have any. When in reality, at a global level, we are the super rich. But the teacher we're listening to this morning, the teacher that we're seeking to follow, was not. Jesus was depicted in the Gospels as having almost nothing. The, the food he eats comes from fishing or farming, but mostly in the Gospels it comes from donations and the kindness of others. When Jesus wants to make a point about money and paying taxes, he has to ask someone else if he can borrow a coin. And Jesus asks his apprentices, his followers, to do as he did, to follow his example. Jesus asks for simplicity in the lives of his followers, because he himself exemplified simplicity. Jesus demands that his followers prioritize the poor because he himself was poor and prioritized the poor. So, what do we do with this teaching? Well, while not storing up treasure on earth it does not mean shirking your responsibilities or not paying your bills or your taxes or not providing 
food and clothing for yourself and your family. It doesn't mean that. What's really going on, as always, Jesus is challenging the heart. Where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And so it's our relationship with money and possessions that needs to change. And as always, we see that Jesus is building on the teaching of the Old Testament scriptures. So here's just one verse from Proverbs 23. Do not wear, wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Cast but a glance at riches and they're gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. And that's just one example. Again and again, the Old Testament cautions against the idolatry of riches and possessions and the dangers of accumulation. And at the same time, it upholds God's need for justice and the need to distribute excess so that the needy would be cared for. And so this is built into Jesus' teaching, this idea that those with much should care for those with little. And the New Testament writers, they carry on with this uh, theme from Jesus' teaching. This is a slightly longer quote from James chapter 5. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. This warning against wealth, against extravagance, against luxurious living, and all of that is there throughout the scriptures. Uh, one uh, scholar, a guy called Scott McKnight, he was kind of doing some uh, study uh, around this from the perspective, like us, of one who is in the world's kind of super rich. And he concluded this, the irony of wealthy followers of Jesus cannot be ignored. The irony of wealthy followers of Jesus cannot be ignored. So what do we do with this, this teaching this morning? Are, are we to own nothing? Are we to go into work if we work or, or write to the, the pensions department and request a reduction in, in what we receive uh, from them? Should we be selling all of our stuff to give the money to the poor? Gregory Boyd uh, says this. Jesus tells us that unless we give up all our possessions, we cannot be a disciple of his. I don't interpret this to mean that we can't legally own anything since most of the disciples he was speaking to continued to earn money and live in houses. But it does mean we can't consider anything we legally own or any money that we legally earn to be our possessions. They belong to God and as such we are called to seek his will as to how that wealth should be spent. So, we're to pursue this call to live as though we have nothing, even if we have very much. One person said, to keep the things you own from owning you, you have to let them go. And there seems to be this thing where, as soon as we have some wealth, we desire more. And we then become more concerned with who has what and how we get more or how we kind of protect and hold on to the wealth that we do have. So there's a kind of equation at work where kind of as soon as our wealth increases, we have an increased concern for wealth. And at the same time, a decreased contentment with our wealth. But I think the same is also true in reverse. Where we have a decrease of wealth, where we let go of stuff, we also have a decreased concern for wealth and at the same time an increased contentment with the things we have. I was privileged uh, a few years ago now uh, to go to, to Tanzania. It's just as I was finishing my degree and, and we spent just a few weeks out there doing a few 
a few different things. And at the place we went to, there was no electricity, so therefore no Wi-Fi, no, you know, none of that stuff, nothing electrical, no running water or sanitation works. It was really basic, simple living, water being fetched from the nearest river each day. And whilst we were there trying to help and put some infrastructure in place so that they could have a school, and that was the main thing we were working on, what we realised was that the people we were there, the families that we were meeting, were, I think, the happiest and most contented people I've ever had the privilege to meet. As long as they had food and water each day, they were happy. And with the little that they had, the first thought of theirs was to share it with others. So when we provided a, a makeshift football um, for them to, uh, to, to play with, we kind of just bundled some stuff together and tied it together with strings so that they could kick it around. The first thing they wanted to do was to go and show it and share it with others around them. And one story, that, one incident that really stuck in my mind from that trip was uh, we were walking back, so we kind of, we'd, we'd do some building work until the, the hottest part of the day, and then we'd walk back to where we were staying. And, and ahead of us on the track, we saw these two children walking ahead of us the same direction that we were heading. And they would walk about 20 paces and then stop. And then they'd walk 20 paces and stop. And we wondered, to start with, whether maybe they were falling out with each other and they kept stopping to kind of have a bit more of the argument. But as we got closer, we could see what was really going on. This was in the heat of the day. The ground was so hot. I mean, hot enough to, to burn your feet. And as we got close enough to them, we could see that these two children had one pair of sandals. And every 20 paces, they were stopping so that they could swap and the other one's feet would have a break from the hard, hot earth. They had so little, and yet their first thought was to share the little they had. They were so unconcerned with wealth. And what a challenge for us in a setting where we have so much. We might think it would be easier to be generous if we had more, but that's not generally how it works. If you're not generous with little, you're not likely to be generous with much either. Because it's not about how wealthy we are, it's about whether we live as though that wealth is ours or God. Now, a teaching like this is not the sort of week where we kind of have a really specific in-the-moment kind of response. This isn't an altar call type of teaching. This is a journey that each of us will be on. And so it's more about thinking, what are the next steps that we might need to take? So a few, a few steps, a few things to ponder as we finish. Firstly, own nothing for display. Display nothing that you own. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think this is saying that you know, a, a framed photo of your family on the wall is, is wrong in, in some way. It's, it's about refraining from showcasing your wealth or your things for others. You may have noticed in the last few teachings we've heard, there's that line about your father who sees what is done in secret. None of this stuff to do with following Jesus is for the benefit of the crowds. It's for the audience of one. And, and so I just wonder with this one, how differently would we shop if we knew that nobody would ever see what we've bought? Would it change the clothes we wear, the food we eat, the car we drive, the, the way we accessorize our homes? How would we shop differently if it was only God's eyes that were on our purchases? Secondly, get rid of stuff, especially stuff that you you don't want to get rid of, but kind of know you should. Things that have started to own you instead of you owning it. Because the more we have, the more we're seduced by the prospect of having. And the best way to curb that seduction is to get rid of some stuff. Thirdly, treat your money and belongings as though they aren't yours. I'm aware we have a distinct advantage uh, living in a vicarage. You know, it, it is not our home. It's provided for us so that we have a base for ministry in the parish and the communities that we serve. And so we try to reflect that in the way we use our home. We open it as often as we can and we, we have people sharing meals and we hold groups and we, we have people living with us when that's appropriate. And, and we try to use that space to be generous with it, remembering and reminding ourselves that it, it isn't ours. 
we can each do that in different ways. How are, we, how are we using our greatest possessions, as it were, our greatest assets, generously and for the benefit of others? And the same with our income. What we tend to do with our, with our money so often to begin with is we, we have the money that comes in and then we kind of we say, okay, this is the slice that I'm giving back to God and then I can do what I want with the rest. And the journey that, that I'm on, that we're on as a family is to is to flip that around and to say, here's the money that comes in. God, this is yours. How much of it do we really need for us? And the rest, what do you want us to do with that? Just turning that question around, remembering that it isn't ours at any point, though we do get to use some of it and enjoy it even. God's concern in giving us things is not that we should have, but that we also should give as he has given to us. And then fourthly, to practice the way of Jesus is to store up treasure in heaven. Every time we choose generosity instead of greed, when we deliberately choose to live in simplicity when excess maybe feels more natural, when we prioritise practising the spiritual disciplines over shopping and entertainment and comfort, So maybe for some of us, the, the lure is to, you know, to have the right things so that other people might look on our lives and think, yep, you've, you've got it all together, to look the part. For others, the lure may be more towards a life of comfort and security and knowing that we're okay and that we're going to have enough. And the invitation of Jesus this morning, I believe, is, is to give all of that up in favour of something better. The way of Jesus is not lucrative, it's not comfortable. It's not a promising route to safety even. In fact, Jesus repeatedly assures his disciples that if we do follow him, we'll likely face poverty, persecution, and discomfort. But, but we will know God, and we will be known by God. And in this, we will have treasure so precious, so valuable, that it will expose all the other kind of futile chasing after earthly treasure as worthless. Let me finish by reading a parable over us. A short parable from a little later in Matthew's Gospel. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and he went and sold all he had, and he went and bought that field. May we find treasure in God and may we give all that we have to gain it. Father, that's our prayer this morning. May we find treasure in you. May we give all that we have in order to gain it.